My name is George. I'm the CEO of Comma AI. And All right. Um, so we have a self driving car. Uh, we do, it's true. Uh, it's about on par, I'd say it's a little bit better than Tesla Autopilot. Does anyone try Tesla Autopilot? Right? Cool. It, it kind of is where uh, self driving cars are today. You know, you'll hear from a lot of companies like Drive.ai or Zooks or these companies have not, right? Um, there's literally <laughs> really three companies in the world with self driving car technology today. There is Google, who has phenomenal self driving cars, but Chris Hermiston just left and they will never ship. Tesla, who has a lot of the right ideas, but I mean, you guys are all eating the, I assume the food is free. I have Tesla, there's no free food. There's no, uh, there's no cafeteria. Now this is shocking, right? This is why if you're good at machine learning, it's very in demand. Uh, maybe too much in demand. I think machine learning people get paid too much. But, um, <laughs> but why wouldn't you go to Google or even Apple? Why would you go to Tesla? Both Google and Apple have Google. Apple makes you pay, but it's actually really good. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we have a self-driving car, and our mission is to build the world's first superhuman driving agent. Um, so how do you do this, right? So here's basically my idea. I'm not a, you know, Google self-driving cars all hand-coded with huge sets of rules, and I mean, in machine learning terminology, they hand-code features. Right? They write feature detectors from LiDAR, which is a lot more structured than cameras. They write a feature detector. This is a car. This is a pedestrian. Then we're going to hand code sets of models for cars and pedestrians. Right? This is kind of the old school way of doing things. Well, you guys all know something about deep learning. I, I assume so. Here's my idea. How do you, how do, you do it? How do you build a, a self driving car? Well, Start out with how do humans drive cars, right? Because we know this is possible. Humans are the only thing that can drive a car. Even Google's self-driving car, they have they go about a thousand miles between disengagement events, between a human needing to take over, which is you know not even close to the safety record. Um, the humans have driving cars. Humans are actually really good at driving cars. Um, who can take a guess at what the fatality rate is? How many miles do you think before you die? Driving a car. <laughs> what? 60 million. 60 million close. All right, yeah, about, about, about um, 100 million miles um, before you die driving a car, right? So don't drive a car 100 million miles. Um, <laughs> that is actually really incredibly good. And then some people will tell you things like you need LiDAR for self driving cars. You don't. Uh, the reason humans do crash cars is almost always one of three reasons they are drunk, they are distracted, or they are asleep. Um, computers don't do any of those things, so even if we built a computer that used the same sensors as a human, you should be able to build a really phenomenal self-driving car. So, when well, humans have eyes, or like cameras, pretty much the same thing. Human eyes actually a really incredible camera. Um, you've got, the thing that's really uh, unmatched about the human eye is the dynamic range. Um, so if you guys are familiar with how camera sensors work, you pretty much set one gain globally for the whole sensor. Some of the new sensors you can set alternating row gains, which is pretty cool, but um, the human eye has different patches can be set to different gains. A uh, human eye has phenomenal dynamic range, but you can get really good cameras today. So let's get a really good camera, hook it up to, well, a brain, and then, you know, the brain controls these actuators. Uh, pedals and a steering wheel. So, I'm going to erase this. We have another one over there. <laughs> let's, uh, let's draw out the diagram for, for what this thing is. Um, so here we have our camera input. No, we'll put it through my cognet. Right. Um, we'll do some fully connected layers, and we will output literally um, steering, gas, and brakes. Right. Uh, so why doesn't this work? What do I forget? Right, what, why can't I just do this? I have a camera, I get this. Um, tons of data and do this, so we're missing uh, recurrence, right? We're gonna need some sort of recurrence. But basically, once you add in recurrence, this system should be able to drive the car, right? So, being the, you know, 
Let's get a huge data set, right? Let's get a huge data set to shove into this thing. How did we solve computer vision? We did not solve it by working on our orb features or our SIFT features and uh, refining our uh, what are the, the SVMs. No, um, no, we, we didn't do that. We just made uh, really big neural networks, really great optimizers, and a huge amount of data. So this is what we did. Um, this is our, we have a phone app called Schiffer. Uh, the iOS version is called Dash. The guy who wrote the iOS version is like, this is actually a good app. You can't call it something terrible like Schiffer and use that as an icon. So, you know, he branded it pretty nicely. But um, this is how much data we get. We have 300,000 miles of 30 frame per second video of people driving cars. So what we can do is we can take that video and we can back solve for what the steering gas and the brakes were at every position, and then we can train this huge neural net. Shouldn't this be a self-driving car? Should work, right? Well, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. I'm gonna show two of the problems um, that we ran into with this rather naive idea. Um, behavioral cloning, which is what this is, does not work, right? Behavioral cloning, like let's straight up take tons of pairs of camera data and outputs and let's just you know backdrop this. This is, you are trying to clone the behavior of a human. And I'll draw two scenarios for why the very naive thing that I drew up here does not work. and see if anyone can come up with solutions for it. So scenario one is this. Um, so basically the way we've actually parameterized the network is not quite to steering gas and brakes. Um, we've parameterized it into paths, right? So the network takes in a picture and outputs the path that the car should drive. So in this scenario, where these are your two lane lines, this is your car, the car will continue in a straight line and it will output a straight line and it's, it's pretty good. Um, so, how about this scenario? The car is over here <coughs> on the left side of the lane. Never mind how it got here. What do you think the net will output? Driving a straight line. Driving a straight line. And this is not what you want. You want the car to recover and go back to the center. But this is a problem with behavioral cloning. Behavioral cloning does not have a goal in mind. Behavioral cloning is just like, let's autocomplete whatever we've seen before, right? So we've seen in this scenario, most people drive in a straight line because probably there's some latent variable like a truck here, right? So the human is on the side of the lane and that recovery movement only happens for a tiny amount. So let's just talk about like going around a truck. Let's erase this and move into the time dimension. Um, so in the time dimension, you're gonna have this. You're gonna have Here's your steering angle. You're going to have a tiny blip which goes up here, and then you're going to keep your steering angle straight, and you have a tiny blip which goes down here, right? So this is like time, and this is like steering angle, right? If your loss is something like mean squared error, you just don't have too much to lose by always predicting straight. So this is one of the big problems. So how do you solve the problem? What's the traditional technique? What am I missing here? How do you how do you how do you use machine learning for this? Someone mentioned it to me before. Machine learning for video games. How do you use reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning, right? Um, so reinforcement learning, you run into an interesting problem. Reinforcement learning requires one of two things: either a simulator or an environment which you can actually uh, act in and you know go explore, exploit. Well, I don't really want my self-driving car exploring, right? <laughs> um, simulators, uh, Chris Ernston, the head of the Google Software and Car Project this last week says, came by the office, um, and it's what I really liked. Simulation is doomed to succeed. Of course it is, right? Your simulator is nowhere near as complex as the real world. Your net is going to learn, usually, tricks of the simulator, and it's unclear how well these things translate. Um, that's a, that's a difference of opinion. You know, you have people like OpenAI who think they can solve all of AI in simulation. I don't necessarily agree with um, I think you're able to do some stuff, and you can test certain stuff in simulation, but to truly build something in a simulator and then put it on the road, I don't think it's gonna work all that well. Um, because what you've done by creating a simulator is you've gone back to coding every rule of driving, right? So you may not have to code the rules explicitly, but you've coded them in something, right? Uh, there was a Tesla accident uh, where a truck cut across the road 
and you know, autopilot went right through the truck, didn't see it there. Um, I mean, unless your simulator was code to have trucks cut across, your simulator would have never caught this. So reinforcement learning, can't really be used. Um, there's another technique, inverse reinforcement learning, which is reinforcement learning when you don't have, um, you know, uh, like a, a simulator, right? You have, so to put this in more precise terminology, um, we have lots of state action pairs, right? So if you have lots of state action pairs, you can't uh, normally do reinforcement learning. In order to do reinforcement learning, you need this function. Function, we're given a state and an action, you get out the new state. Another word for this is a simulator. Um, inverse reinforcement learning is a really cool paper by uh, Andrew, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name, he's another machine learning guy, um, <laughs> the helicopter paper, where he uh, used inverse reinforcement learning to learn how to get helicopters to do really cool maneuvers like inverted hovers. Um, unfortunately, this is not the same as the car problem. In the helicopter problem, you <clears throat> the problem is not figuring out when you are in the desired state or trying to find the desired state, the problem is literally what control inputs get me to the desired state. Um, helicopters are actually hard, if you've ever tried to fire them up, the helicopter is actually pretty hard. Um, cars actually getting to the state is easy. Uh, cars are two dimensions. I mean, you have a this way, this way dimension, and a this way, this way dimension. And you don't even have to change them too much, right? It's not like a helicopter. Cars, the hard problem is figuring out where should I go, not how do I get there once I figure out where should I go. Let's come back to the simulator. Um, can you learn this? I mean, we have this in data, right? So instead of trying to directly learn the policy, what if we learn a simulator? Um, so you have a few problems. One is these states are uh, pictures. Um, algorithms don't work that great to uh, produce pictures. Uh, like. This has started to change. Because how many people have seen adversarial networks? If you haven't seen adversarial networks, go look these things up. Open AI is really interested in them. Um, so what we did with adversarial networks, think of adversarial networks as fancy autoencoders. So we, we trained a net to go from uh, an image uh, using an encoder network down to a Gaussian space um, decoder network, reproduce something pretty close to the image, and then obviously don't use mean squared error on images, use the adversarial trick. Um, but you have this, this Gaussian space here, uh, and it's like 512 dimensions or something, right? And then we tried to learn the simulator on that. Um, this was one of our interns projects over the summer. We're not quite there yet. It would be really cool if you could learn the simulator from data, because once you learn the simulator from data, there's even ways to learn the reward function from data, too. You can start to do reinforcement learning on it. Um, so no one really at the company was going to continue working on it, because we have a lot of other things to do, so we open sourced the whole thing. GitHub slash kind of AI slash research. We've open sourced a small behavioral quality model for people to play with, but the real thing we open sourced was all of this adversarial autoencoder stuff, simulation learning framework, um, and 7.5 hours of training data. So you can go download this and play with this at home. Um, here's another cool little machine learning tidbit. Now, this one is actually very solvable. Two roads are diverged. Uh, on a highway, uh, and in my data, I have traveled both. <laughs> but as a neural network, I took the average, and everybody died. <laughs> I mean, that's literally that's what a neural network does, right? If you've trained it on half going left and half going right, the neural network actually does. I mean, the average minimizes most loss functions, right? <laughs> Especially a loss function like mean squared error where you have a slope like this. Um, mean absolute error is a bit better about this, and then you can even like, you know, do exponent to like the 0.08, and get, you know, something that looks like that. Um, that's better. But the real solution here, you don't have any ideas? What's well, a better loss function, right? You don't use mean squared error, because you're only outputting one path, right? How do you output two paths? This mixture of Gaussians, 
right? Like I can make my output space literally whatever I want. And if I make it like a mixture of Gaussians, I can then use tail divergence. I can train that actually on the, uh, the multiple paths. Uh, obviously, not my idea. Alex Graves' handwriting prediction. Really cool stuff, and you can use this for cars as well. How am I doing on time? You, you got them more. Ten more. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can basically, uh, if you ask me to write the equation for a Gaussian right now, I have to scratch my head a bit. But um, you can parameterize the output space instead of just saying, you know, this is where the path is. You just say, like, how about mean one, standard deviation one, mean two, standard deviation two, and you want to minimize the KL divergence. Right. So that's a full distribution, right? If you're doing something like mean squared error, that's not a distribution. Um, mean squared error is a whole lot more like, I think you can actually view it as things with a uh, standard deviation of one. Um, but you can parameterize it like this, and you can call this the loss function itself, and then when I want to figure out what my loss is, I can actually evaluate the, uh, the function at that mixture of Gaussians, and I can you know, take loss analysis. Um, so yeah, what if there's 30 paths that you did? Well, there aren't, right? I mean, how many paths are there in driving? How many reasonable paths are there like ever in driving? You're in a highway, you have yeah. 40 cars, you're, they're all going below the speed limit. Yeah. You want to go interweave between these cars. You have the data. Oh, well, you don't want to predict that far in advance, right? right. So that's, that's like beyond your threshold. So that's all like, if you want to weave around a car, that's a maneuver, right? So on the highway, your maneuvers are usually continue straight, go into the left lane, or go into the right lane. Right? Or if there's no right lane, sometimes there's an exit. But it turns out that three can parameterize almost all driving situations, except for maybe one intersection in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, <laughs> where you have like four weird things. But like, it's three, four, it's small. It's small, so that this actually is no problem. Isn't the KL divergence expensive to compute? No. No? Why would it be expensive? I mean, you're all these probably distributions. Well, but I don't have to evaluate the entire distribution, right? I just need to evaluate the distribution at the one point in which my ground truth exists. Right. So it's really just as cheap, right? And this is all differential, too. So, um, all, all open source, you can, uh, we wrote like these loss functions for Karas. Karas, we like Karas. Um, yeah, we, we wrote these loss functions for Karas, and it's just like, you write it out, you have to evaluate it at one point. It's really very little um, more math than, than means better. Uh, well, I mean, extend it one at a time. If you want to work it through, start with mean squared error, then make it a Gaussian, right? So you don't need to give it a mixture of Gaussians, you can start out with just a Gaussian piece, right? Um, and this is helpful too, because it tells you when, for example, in this scenario, it may still predict the center path, but it would predict the center path with a whole lot of uncertainty, right? You want to know when cars are uncertain, so you can disengage the system. Um, so yeah. That is our main application of machine learning at Comma AI, and the holy grail is to take all of this data, put it into a massive, massive network, and build a superhuman guide. Um, there's another really cool application that we've been working on, we've been working on a bit more seriously, because there's huge opportunities to monetize this right now. Um, you know, self-driving cars are Self-driving cars are, uh, you want to go real, true self-driving cars, it's not just a technical problem, it's a political problem, I don't mean, play politics, but uh, mapping. We have all of this camera data of everywhere. This is like street view, but instead of just having one pass of the streets, this is some streets. And it's live updated. We have a live updated street view. Uh, street View also, I built the, uh, the prototype of the camera that's currently in all the Street View cars. It's 15 FPS. We got 30 FPS. Um, <laughs> double. Double. I'm a big fan of Double. Big, am I a big fan of Double? Um, oh, yeah. I love Double. Elon Musk, I'm going to charge him Double. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, this is our coverage of SF from this app. Uh, well, this is our coverage of the US. So, uh, I'm sure we got a few users in Kansas. Uh, but the idea is basically this. You guys know what SLAM is? It's robotics. The first person who figures out, oh, it's all feature based too. The first person who figures out how to make a deep learning SLAM, well, actually, don't figure it out just yet. Come work at Common AI, figure it out at Common AI, and we'll all get rich. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, SLAM is this idea that, like, uh, it's simultaneous localization and mapping. So we have all 
of these cell phone videos correlated with GPS, correlated with accelerometer data. For some people, correlated with the CAN bus on their car. CAN bus on the car is getting you uh, speed, uh, steering wheel angle, at different wheel speeds. Every wheel on a modern car has a different speed sensor. So when you go around a turn, you know, the wheels on the right, it's been slower than the wheels on the left, you go around and turn. Um, so yeah, you uh, can get all that data correlated together, do a super good job of recovering the location of the, uh, of the car. And then points in the, the real world are in three dimensions. How do you get three dimension data with cameras? What's the traditional one? It's the one that everyone thinks of. Two cameras, stereo, right? Oh, uh, so we have one camera. How do we do it with one camera? Oh, two different pictures. Two, two, yeah, two pictures. Take two different pictures, exactly, right? And fortunately, you have this car that is moving. So here is, you know, picture one, and then the car is moving, and here is picture two. <laughs> and guess what? You can treat those two pictures as a, you know, as the same way you treat stereo, right? Uh, you can use this technique called structure for motion, and you can figure out the actual 3D locations of all of these points. So we can make incredible maps of the world from cell phones, right? Um, there's, a, there's a video I really like, uh, humans need not apply, and they talk about how the future is not the latest and greatest newest technologies, it's the newest and greatest technologies from five years ago made cheap and widely available. And that's really the whole idea of coming out. This car, pretty accurate, self-driving. It's a prototype. We called it feature complete three months ago. For the last three months, what we've been working on is productization. Unlike every other self-driving car company to date, except Tesla, we are actually going to ship a self-driving car. Self-driving kit by the end of the year for under $1,000. And then, once we have all of these kits out here, and we have a model deployed to all of the kits, every single mistake any one of those cars made will be sent to us with all of the data back through the cell phone network. And we can make our machine learning algorithms better. And then, if our self-driving car is better, well, no one's going to buy the competitor self-driving so more people will buy apples, which will give us more data, <coughs> which will make our self-driving car even better. This is positive feedback. We plan to own this entire space in three years. If you want to work here, vivid comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the interview is hard. <laughs> uh, that's the talk. Yep, thank you. Question.